There are a handful of moments in human history when our world is very much a world before and a world after. And especially in this one, nuclear attack. Prepare for nuclear attack! April 1945. Mere hours after Harry Truman is sworn in as American president after the death of Franklin Roosevelt, he is led to a meeting with Secretary of War Henry Louis Stimson. Stimson tells the new president about the real purpose of the secret Manhattan Project, laying out exactly what the teams of the nation's top physicists and engineers have been working on for so long. Using electromagnetic separation, they have learned that a fast chain reaction can release an incredible amount of energy, harnessing the power of the atom. And they have turned that concept into a weapon of destructive power never before created in the history of mankind. From an outside view, the Second World War is wrapping up. Germany's done for, and Japan's surrender seems perhaps only a few months away. However, the alliance between the Western Allies and the Soviet Union is more fragile than ever. With the Red Army marching into Poland, Hungary, and Romania, President Truman watches with worry as the Soviets tighten their grip on half of Europe. The U.S. administration is strictly opposed to the autocratic Soviet system of state control and secret police, but they still may need Soviet help to bring the war against Japan to a quick conclusion. It has become a political poker game between the two power blocks, and each asset a card that is thrown onto the table. But now, with the atomic bomb becoming a reality, the U.S. finds itself with an ace up its sleeve and a means to dictate terms to the post-war world. By the time of the Potsdam Conference in mid-July, the final experiments, codenamed Trinity, have proven that the atomic bomb truly works. But while the Truman administration sends its congratulations, more and more scientists within the Manhattan Project voice their concerns about the correct use of the bomb's unprecedented killing power. Prominent physicist Leo Szilard is the loudest advocate for a careful approach. He emphasizes that War has to be restrained within the bounds of common humanity. Why not keep the weapon, but not use it? The, the war will be over soon, maybe six more months. A naval blockade will, it will be surely enough to starve the Japanese into surrender. Japan has no allies left, no surface navy or air force, while the US has inexhaustible resources. By unleashing the atomic bomb, Sealard argues, the US will not only lose its moral superiority, but also its industrial advantage. The biggest strength of the American military is that its heavy armament industry can outproduce everyone else on the planet, but an atomic arms race will void this advantage. For now, the US has the monopoly, but it will not keep it forever. How long will the Soviet Union need to build atomics from scratch? 10 years? Maybe five if they make use of captured German scientists or spies within the US. What would the world become if those fundamentally opposed systems ever made use of the bomb? On the other side stands the US military, which argues that having such a bomb and not using it is unjustifiable to the American people. The invasion of Okinawa cost over 12,000 American soldiers their lives. How many more would die in an invasion of the Japanese mainland? against an enemy that says it will arm its people even with bamboo sticks to avoid unconditional surrender. For many in the military, total war justifies total death. How many millions had already died man-made deaths in World War II? The US Air Force had turned Hamburg and Dresden to burning ruins and had killed 100,000 people in Tokyo. Ultimately, the bomb is not much different in what it would achieve, they argue, but instead would save a great many American lives. The bomb itself has to be the message, unconditional surrender or total destruction. The target committee is set up to list possible Japanese cities. The chosen city has to be well within the range of the B-29 Super Fortress bombers, which must be extra modified to carry such a unique, single, large bomb. 
To accurately study the effects of the explosion, the target must be untouched by previous bombing raids. Only then can the damage and the power of the bomb be accurately determined. The target should be military in nature. A city that has at least a large troop concentration, stores military equipment, or houses important headquarters. Eventually, the choice comes down to two cities. The first is Kyoto, the ancient capital of Japan. Not only does it have a large industrial area, it's also the intellectual center of Japan. Destroying it would have a large psychological effect on Japanese society. The other city is Hiroshima. It has an important army embarkation port and a huge urban area. Additionally, the surrounding heights there would add a focusing effect to the blast damage. Secretary Stimson is appalled by the coldness of the calculations, and he personally forbids the destruction of Kyoto. If they have to kill a whole lot of people, then at least they can spare their history and culture. Hiroshima is top of the list. So they calculate the correct height of the detonation, the radiological effects, and the predicted expenditure of the bomb's energy. The first bomb, little boy, is expected to have the same impact of an amount between 5 and 20,000 tons of TNT. The Trinity testing has proven that their theories work. But there is still a lot of speculation. Would a chain reaction maybe set the whole atmosphere of the Earth on fire? Ah, who really knew? The men on board the designated B-29, nicknamed Enola Gay after the pilot's mother, know little of all those discussions and speculations. On the night of August 6, they load the 9,700-pound armored cylinder into the compartment of the bomber and take off towards Hiroshima. At 3 a.m., the weaponeers begin readying the bomb, preparing its triple fusing system. At 6, they approach Iwo Jima and are joined by other planes that will observe and photograph the results. At 7.30, as they climb to the bombing altitude, the internal batteries of Little Boy are activated. The weather reports are favorable. The crew of the Enola Gay put on their flak suits and anti-glare goggles and prepare for the countdown. At 8.15 a.m., the bomb bay opens and the bomb drops. As Little Boy falls to Earth, the arming wires are removed, starting its internal clocks. As the bomber banks away, the bomb's radar activates, sending signals towards the ground. At the predetermined altitude, an electrical signal reaches the fusing system, closing the circuit. 43 seconds after Little Boy leaves the Enola Gay, a bright light fills the plane and the first shockwave violently shakes it. Behind them, Hiroshima vanishes in a boiling mushroom cloud. The people of Hiroshima have begun their day like any other in those troubled times. The morning is mostly quiet until the air sirens begin and people look to the sky searching for incoming planes. The evacuation program has reduced the city's inhabitants to around 245,000 people. And almost no one that is lucky enough to survive the day remembers hearing the sound of the bomb's explosion. For them, it is a noiseless flash followed by a wave of unimaginable heat. Everything close to the explosion is immediately obliterated as the pressure wave advances at two miles per second. Most homes in Japan are made out of wooden frames and wooden walls, which instantly collapse or burn as the released thermal energy engulfs everything in a blue-green fireball. Those further away who watch the bomb explode are immediately blinded by the flash. Survivors soon wander the streets, escaping the fires of their homes. Their clothes are torn to rags, their swollen faces blistered, their skin, black from third-degree burns, peels off their bodies. Like sleepwalkers, they wander through the smoldering ruins that were their city moments before. The child, making a suffering, groaning sound, his burned face swollen up, balloon-like and jerking as he wanders among the fires. The old man, the skin of his face and body peeling off like a potato skin, mumbling prayers while he flees with faltering steps. Another man pressing with both hands the wound from which blood is steadily dripping, rushing around as though he's gone mad and calling the names of his wife and child, 
Ah, my hair seems to stand on end just to remember. This is the way war really looks. 140,000 people die in the immediate explosion of the bomb. Thousands more will soon die of their wounds, but even those who survive the initial bomb cannot escape the radiation. Those exposed to the direct gamma radiation are slowly dying already, suffering for years. After five years, the number of dead rises to 200,000. But despite the nightmarish reports, the war is still not over. And Fat Man, the implosion bomb, is being ready. A new target is at the top of the list. This time, it is the city of Nagasaki, and another B-29 bomber soon takes off. 70,000 will die this time, and Japan will finally surrender. The atomic age has begun. Scientists are already working on improved implosion systems and the potential of thermonuclear fission that could unleash the equivalent of over 100 million tons of TNT, dwarfing Little Boy and Fat Man by far. The Second World War is over, but the world has entered an era potentially far more frightening. So, uh, you know, this is a very, obviously, very heavy subject matter. Yep. Um, is it something that you thought about first and said, we should write a song about this? Or, or how did the song evolve? Was it music first, lyrics first? Or? The music we had first, and actually the first time we played this live was back, oh, 2000, I don't remember, a long time ago. And the lyrics weren't finished. We, some, we had okay. some of it. and. Uh, Bit of a weird history with that well, one. What did you do if you didn't have the full lyrics? You're the same. Oh, we had the we had the the chorus, which has harmonies in it and stuff like that. Yeah. That was written and some other parts, but I just pretended and went <laughs> in the verses when we were specifically. We did it. <laughs> which is which now in retrospect feels uh, less than honorary. Given the subject, okay, but you again, Fitting. you're you're chroniclers, you're not opinioners. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's just uh, one of the few times in history where we didn't do it uh, properly. We should have finished the song uh, and stuff like that. No, not only regarding to history, but regarding regarding to the fans yeah. who were there at the okay. time. Given, yeah, sure, there weren't that many at that time. But now, uh, how often has this song been in your live repertoire? Not that much at all, actually. I mean, this one came out on the Atero Dominatis album. Yeah. We did the first, well, Nightliner European tour with Edguy and Dragon Force in early 2006. So we had just actually, funnily enough, we had to accelerate the recording. We did the recording and mixing and mastering of that album in like three weeks. So, I mean, it was um, tumultuous times. And when we got out on tour, uh, that album hadn't been released. You know, after a while, uh, you are re we're going in and doing The Art of War, and we had a lot of songs that became very popular. Sure. So by that time, I think already by the next album rotation, unfortunately, Nuclear Attack got uh, Well, this leads to an out. interesting question, because at this point, you have dozens and dozens of songs, and you write, you know, you'll release another dozen every two years or whatever, something like that. And of course, with a new tour, the great tour, for example, you want to play a lot of the songs from the from the new albums. Do you really miss playing a lot of the older ones sometimes? Do you get to throw them in often enough and mix it up? On it's and, it's different. Some of them are it's truly good to be rid of them. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them I really Name miss. Name one. <laughs> Ooh, mm. no, I'm not gonna do that. Okay. You know, every time we do a set list for a tour, this is a c kind of a what do you call it? Common question uh, among. Yeah fans and it's really tricky for us because people are in in general uh, appreciating the era of a band not only us yeah. where they discovered the band of course so we try to sometimes we reactivate an old song like we did with a song called double seven thirty four uh, we did it now with uh, angels calling so we're we're constantly looking for ways to sneak in a few well gems well, one thing I really really liked on the Sabaton cruise last December was the two shows, you know, you do two shows and you play different songs. 
Yeah, but it's it's also during those shows because if you catch us, for example, at a festival, yeah, yeah. there's gonna be a, a good chance for us to get new fans. So yeah. what we want to do is play a bit of more of a party set, a sure, bit of yeah. more of a greatest hits. Try to get some new fans in there. I think you should just play resist and bite like 20 <laughs> minutes. I we only work line. in Belgium. <laughs> that's, sorry, but I love that song. I, that's my favorite. That's my favorite. Oh, really? Yeah, that's my okay. favorite. So, and actually, it would never was, but uh, it was when you guys played it live on the Sabbath on Cruise. Okay. So that was like, I never understood that song until I heard it live. Okay, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's like, weird. I mean, some know. songs turn into something different live. Yeah. So and Nuclear Attack, resistant. I would say, is one of those songs. Okay. It yeah. actually works amazing live. I really love performing it. Well, maybe maybe in the next couple of years when you're allowed to play shows again, you can bring back Nuclear Attack yeah. one day. As soon as uh, this lockdown is over. Well, hopefully it'll be over by, by Sabbath on Cruise time because then they'll play Resist and Bite and Nuclear Attack, but on two different nights. So that... Thanks for making promises, man. <laughs> I'm not promising. I'm not in the band. I can say what I like. I can say the first night they're going to play this and this and this and... and the editors can go, no, no, no. You're adding buzzes, aren't you? Oh, and of course, the 90s R&B favorites. Yeah, I mean, gonna but they're that always going to be there. Well, that's the second day. That's yep. the second day of the Sabaton Cruise. Yeah, we should have you perform that. We should. Actually, we should have me on the next Sabaton Cruise. I'm just throwing this out. Okay. And you can't say yes or no when the camera's running. You can decide afterwards if he does it. Okay. It's probably going to be no. Right? <laughs> but, but you can't say, okay. Okay. The second day of the Sabaton cruise, right? We should have me in the piano bar with the grand piano. Liking it so far? Yep. Playing Sabaton songs, right? Mm -hmm. But as 90s R&B songs. I love it. Honestly, yeah. let us know if you want that. I would, uh, come on, that'd no, be fun, no matter right? how you want to play them, in I'm, a piano I'm, bar, yeah. sing along, we can have people around. I'm a really good piano player, trust me on this. So, so it'll be, it'll be okay, what do you think? Cool. All right, deal, a deal. A deal. All right, I got it. Oh, don't shake hands, by the way, Corona. Oh yeah, right. Oh, uh, I've already had it. You already had it? Yes, so. I haven't. Can we zoom in on that? Just zoom in on that and just have things saying, See you next time on Sabaton History. I think that's a good ending. All right, everyone, you know the drill. You click, 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 get some subscriptions, check out Indy's other channels, become a Patreon. That's it, get the fuck out of here!